Elgin dealers continue to charge almost $2 over spot for one ounce silver rounds. SD Bullion is selling one ounce silver rounds at only 49 cents over spot on any quantity. Again, that's 999 fine silver for just 49 cents over spot for any quantity. If you haven't joined the over 40,000 precious metals investors by making the switch to SD Bullion, what are you waiting for? You could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars on your next order. SD Bullion, the lowest prices, period. This viewer is wanting to know, what is your opinion on the restrictions one faces when trying to sell physical precious metals? And they're wanting to know if you wanted to share any personal testimony that when trying to sell precious metals, if you've had any kind of problems, like are there a lot of restrictions, like you have to fill out a lot of forms, are there like max limits on how much you can sell, um, if, or if you just have any knowledge about this. And do you think the increasing restrictions there are is kind of making people shy away from trying to invest in physical precious metals. I actually hear far more. I don't talk about personal experiences ever. Uh, it's, it's not a, a wise practice. What I have learned is it's far more cumbersome with restrictions and paperwork to purchase. Now that we've got you know, several years of suppressed prices for gold and silver, there's a whole lot more initiative out there for the followers to buy. You don't try to sell with you know earnest urgency at these ridiculously low prices. You, te you try to buy. Uh, and there are a lot of restrictions and obstacles that I hear about uh, for legitimate attempts to purchase gold coins, silver coins, for all the paperwork. <clears throat> the paperwork appears to be in sync with admission of terrorism activities, uh, like opposing the government, the little, little wording in there, uh, source of funds. When you buy a house, you don't have to fill out forms for your source of funds. If you buy a car, you don't have to fill out forms for source of funds. If you want to buy artwork, <clears throat> You want to buy some expensive uh, room additions, build a swimming pool. You don't have to fill out forms for origin of funds. So there is a direct assault against the demand for gold and silver. Uh, it's not seen in any other market, well, except for maybe explosives. But I don't want to go there. As for restrictions on selling, <clears throat> I, I don't know that there are very many restrictions. There, there are just forms on, you know, taxable events, taxable event for profit. I mean, but uh, really, how many people have a lot of profit in the last couple of years from selling gold coins? Uh, I've got a couple of clients who say, Jim, I'm I'm in a bad spot for the last four years three years, two years, I've had to sell every couple months a few coins to cover living expenses, and I don't like it. And all I say to them is that's unfortunate that you haven't maintained income in order to stay on the sidelines for having to sell anything. And they say, yeah, well, you know, things happen. And things do happen. <clears throat> I'm fortunate that uh, I have pretty steady newsletter income. Uh, and I, I will admit, it's not as much as it was a year or two ago. Uh, it, it is in slight decline. And uh, I attribute it to both the suppressed gold price, you know, precious metals prices, and to a unbelievably wretched economy that is not in any way, shape, or form in a sluggish recovery mode. I think we're approaching a collapse scenario for the U.S. economy. And if it was in recovery mode, how come we had a thousand store closings so far this year? It's because the consumption model has contributed mightily to killing the U.S. economy. 
we're so stupid as a nation of economic uh, guidance, we still stick to the stupidity of the consumption model as opposed to the investment model. Why did China have a huge burst in the last 10 to 15 years in growth? Because they weren't necessarily encouraging spending. They were encouraging business investment, hiring. U.S. brain trust, they've gone moronic. We, we don't even know what capitalism is. We don't know how to create wealth except through a printing press. We don't know how to spread income around except through food stamps and, and just the national dole, welfare. We're, we're a stupid country in our leadership right now. We don't know how to build businesses. Look at what happened with Trump. He had a plan for an annual trillion-dollar infrastructure uh, build-out. And what have we gotten instead? We got a $100 billion, $300 billion Saudi arms deal instead. We're not following through in business investment. The Congress does not encourage it. The Congress encourages the Obama ta- uh, stimulus plan, not, not tax, but stimulus plan. It's handouts. We don't know how to create jobs. We know how to create new handouts. Look what happened after 9-11. Bush, too, announced he wanted people to go out and spend. And Greenspan said, we want people to go out and borrow against their homes so they can spend. There's no mindset toward building businesses. We have huge obstructions to building new businesses. It's called high federal regulations, highest in the world for corporate income tax, Workman compensation, which is, you know, it sounds like a very good thing, except if it goes too far, it inhibits business. And I ask a very basic question about the Saudi arms deal. And you can you can follow up on this later in the interview or you can leave it alone. The Saudis are issuing bonds to cover their huge deficits as a result of their own problems from a lower oil price and problems from extreme expenses with the Yemen war. So if they're issuing bonds for the first time in their 50-year history, how on earth are they paying for $110 billion worth of arms? They're not. The whole story is a lie. And I have my opinions. We could follow up later if you wish, but uh, I'll just leave it there. All right. I'd like to move now to this next viewer's question about the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Now, he's wanting to know, What's up with the Shanghai Gold Exchange? I thought it was supposed to have a bigger impact on gold prices. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, We did not see the arbitrage that was expected. Here's what I mean by that. We did not see the higher gold price in Shanghai of more than, say, a couple or three percent versus the London and New York price. We just didn't see it, which means the Chinese could not execute on their plan, or they chose not to. Okay, there's an old joke that's been running around for the last three to five years to answer the question, when is the gold price going to take off and move up, up, up? The answer with the joke is when China wants it to. So I had it two-sided there. Shanghai Gold Exchange resulted in the Chinese unable or unwilling to let, the ch- to let the gold price run up, up, up. I believe they're still busy converting their trillion dollars in treasury bonds into gold bullion. Not just gold bullion, but you know, massive infrastructure projects. Uh, not just in China, but in uh, say, Southeast Asia, the entire Pacific Rim, and now this One Belt, One Road. When people are reading about this One Belt, One Road, uh, it's like a tabletop cornucopia of projects, all of them multi-billion, almost all. I ask the question, where's the funding for that? I mean, this is how I distinguish myself from a lot of different analysts, maybe not a lot, some analysts, They think, oh, this is going to be great. But they don't ask the question, where's the funding going to come from? I think it's going to come off the U.S. Treasury bond pile held by China. So 
for two reasons China wants to keep things going so they can acquire more discounted gold and silver and so they can use their treasure bonds at full value for the infrastructure build out for the entire Eurasian trade zone what's in it for China to say okay let's pull the plug on this and hey you know so we lose 700 billion dollars in write downs for the treasury bonds who in his right mind wants to just throw away 700 800 billion dollars in treasury bonds from a default who wants to bring about a default in his own balance sheet that, that just doesn't have any thinking behind it at all so the Chinese are still interested in maintaining the system and have a little side game going where it looks very clear that J.P. Morgan was hired by the Chinese to keep the silver price down and to acquire truckloads and boatloads of silver for replenishing the Chinese silver stockpile. What's in it for China to wreck the dollar? Nothing. Nothing. So, well, except, well, I shouldn't say nothing. I'm just being a little bit uh, silly passionate here. The Chinese want a legitimate monetary system. They don't want their banking system to, to collapse. They don't want the, the Eurasian corner of the world to suffer the consequences of a dollar collapse. But they've got an, an ulterior motive to continue to acquire gold and silver and to continue to use their treasury bills, treasury bonds and bills, for paying for big construction projects, including the pipeline to Russia for oil and gas. China doesn't, doesn't want to throw that away. So they're, they're playing a very delicate game. And, and they also, I hear this from The Voice frequently, <clears throat> the Chinese and Russians do not want to be the blame for the dollar's failure. They want it to fail on its own lack of merit. And I think that makes a great deal of sense. The Chinese want, you know, 10 years from now to be able to say, your dollar failed because you wrecked it, because you engaged in wars, because you printed trillions in it every month in secrecy because you cannot find a buyer for your own national debt financed in the form of a securitized treasury bond. They'd much prefer to say, you killed your own dollar. Don't blame us. History will be our witness. So here's what I think, going, going back to the SGE, and uh, now you got to bring in the Hong Kong exchange. <clears throat> I heard from some very savvy clients recently that the Shanghai Gold Exchange was not enough. I mean, just put aside all the motives to delay and to continue to acquire precious metals and continue to use treasure bonds and contracts. Put that aside for now. It could be the Chinese could not do it with the Shanghai Gold Exchange alone. Think of it this way. The Chinese are like a big guy, a big man. One foot standing in the golden pond of Shanghai, now they have another golden pond within much of their control in Hong Kong. So they have an inside China and outside China leg in the gold market, and they're much better in position to conduct arbitrage and take advantage of price differentials east versus west. Furthermore, Hong Kong has always been a main conduit for gold coming into China. It's like you couldn't send in a bunch of gold into Shanghai without going through Hong Kong. That's very interesting. Now, mixed in with the potential for arbitrage, you have significant, say, Australian gold supply going in to Hong Kong. That might now be used in the arbitrage without having it well known that it's being used in the arbitrage. In other words, Hong Kong has got a very busy traffic terminal. And a lot of stuff can go on without being fully recognized as going on. This is very important. Um, furthermore, the Hong Kong exchange 
is uh, they're the owner of the London Metal Exchange, which I believe before long is going to have some very friendly gold contracts that are going to be taken advantage of by the Easterners, like the Asians. The Hong Kong Exchange, like the Shanghai Exchange, are going to be selling Chinese currency settlement for physically delivered gold. Furthermore, Shanghai has announced in the next few months they're going to have an RMB denominated oil contract. So we have a convergence of oil and gold on the RMB highway. This, I think, will lead to the evolution of the gold trade note used for Chinese oil purchases. It will link gold with oil in RMB settled oil contracts. Oil is important because it's the most, it has the highest volume for its transactions in international commerce. Whatever oil evolves into for its payment systems will dictate what's going on in global trade. By that I mean purchases of grain, cement, timber, international contracts, say for consulting. And, and Euro Raj gave a great example. He said the Indians provide IT support for a healthcare system in Saudi Arabia. Okay, paid in dollars right now, treasury bills. If that ever moves to something else, it might be on the tail of the Chinese paying for their Gulf region oil from the Arabs in RMB or in a gold trade note. I think we're going to see a convergence of the uh, gold trade note with the RMB currency. They might be interchangeable at some point. And that will be a pseudo gold-backed RMB. Very interesting because most, most currencies are traded in the form of a bond or bill. A bill is just a shorter term note, like, you know, two years or less. A bond is 10 years or more. And uh, <clears throat> that's how the distinction comes for the, the new currency. A gold trade note would remove the treasury bill short term for trade payment. But I don't know how except for an actual gold bond like a Chinese government bond payable in gold or a certain percentage like a cover clause paid in gold. That is the device, the vehicle that would push out the treasury bond in banking systems. So again, the, the global currency reserve has two sides to it. Trade payment in shorter term notes, bills, and a longer term version which would be used as a banking asset. Uh, you don't put gold bars in a banking reserve system in your vaults in order to produce income. You do it to remove the potential of an entire national bankruptcy situation, like what you're seeing in Italy. So I hope that answers the question. I, I really do believe the, the new Hong Kong gold exchange is going to be a game changer and a gold market killer. Uh, they're trying to make sure that the hours of activity coincide with the New York gold fix. They're going to try to take control of the New York gold fix from actual market equilibrium activity in Hong Kong. This is very, very big. And, and as soon as you see the London, the London Metal Exchange... Uh, come up with a, a gold uh, a gold futures contract that's deliverable you can, you can just start the countdown, the gold market's going to have a failure. Uh, let me mention something regarding the gold market that uh, is quite important Harvey Organ came out with a, uh, a news brief and analysis report recently saying that more than a few uh, New York based gold futures contracts standing for delivery were given a petition letter by the COMEX <clears throat> that used the word urgency for their consideration 
to accept a cash settlement instead of the medal. The first time they ever used the word emergency, they often just threaten in, in words like, uh, if you intend to become a continued participant in the COMEX, you'll take your cash settlement. So a, th- a threat has moved into an appeal with urgency. That is a very big deal. So we'll see how it plays out next month. But the June delivery, since the month is divisible by three, is very important. We may not get another urgent situation until we're in September. The next, uh, I, think, I don't know what they call it, a controlling contract, the, the, major, the major contract, um, every three months. So interesting times, interesting pressures, and uh, we have some very extraordinary situations that are building up right now, Elijah. All right, and before we let you go, we had one last viewer's question about the current situation with the Gulf states' sudden blockade of Qatar. They're just wondering uh, what your perspective is on this. Okay, regarding the Gulf states, I don't know of any physical blockade, but what I am hearing about is a, uh, a boycott of commerce. So it's not so much ships blocking passage as it is we're not going to do business with you. We're going to have you isolated, Qatar. I think they call it Qatar. I like calling it Qatar. I can call it whatever I want. Uh, There is a big dispute going on regarding certain Gulf Arab nations for participating with Iran. Uh, The Saudis are at, you know, just ridiculous levels of conflict by words and conflict by by hot war with the Iranians. The Saudis are not going to be able to handle Iran. They haven't yet in Yemen, and they're not going to. It's so bad in Yemen for the Saudis that they're now having hot battles, like at the Aden airport, with the UAE. So their neighbors are becoming their enemies inside Yemen, the war within the war. Okay, so a number of Gulf Arab states have either signed or have head nods or handshakes with the Iranians to bring about more peaceful environment in the entire Gulf region. And that really pisses off the Saudis because they want war. They're a satellite slave state of the United States and Great Britain, UK. And They follow the orders of their Anglo-American masters, which means go fight a new war. Don't worry, we'll cover the press press citations and we'll call it a sectarian violence. It's not anything like that. Yemen's not about Sunni versus Shiite, a division of the Muslim. No, not at all. It's about the Saudis having lied for 10 years about their about their uh, uh, spare capacity and reserves, reserve oil fields. They're almost completely out. So they're trying to sell Aramco because there's not much more oil to process. They're trying to sell 10% of Aramco in a grotesquely overpriced initial, pu- initial public offering for their stock. I've seen reports that, that indicate just based on competent regular, normal price analysis of IPOs, compare it to Exxon, compare it to Gulf, uh, well, we got Royal Dutch Shell, compare it to uh, Rosneft of Russia, and you come up with the same conclusion. Aramco's overpriced by a factor of four or five. So why are the Saudis trying to sell it at a ridiculous price? Because they've lost their, they've lost their, uh, their oil reserves. They don't have much you got tremendous depletion after years and years, 30 years of Gawar. Gawar is pumping 98% water. They're not pumping oil. I mean, their big issue there is how do we get the, the oil out of the water? I mean, it's separation methods. Okay, so Qatar is being isolated now by the uh, most of the Gulf Arabs. And I don't know exactly what they claim the offense to be. We're hearing that it's buddying up to the Iranians 
to, to try to bring about more stable environment in the Gulf region. I got my other opinions. Qatar is a main investor, and they're pulling out of Deutsche Bank. Qatar is a recipient of a couple billion dollars from Clinton Foundation's stolen money. They just pull the money out and stick it in Qatar, and I think the Clintons believe that they can have safe passage for hiding out. Refuge. They're buying a refuge. <clears throat> Qatar is also very involved with Gazprom of Russia in LNG facilities. So maybe the other Gulf Arabs don't like some of these activities and are pointing to the buddying up, partnering with the Iranians. I don't know. We're never given the full scoop. We're never given the true story. We have to figure it out. And that's what the Hattrick letter is all about, figuring out these things through inference, through, well, if that were true, we wouldn't see this. If it were true, we'd see the following, and we are. So, you know, that that's simplistic, but that's kind of how some of the thinking goes on toward making conclusions with incomplete and falsified information. And if viewers would like to find you online, did you want to share with the viewers um, your website and also how they can subscribe to your newsletter? Sure. If you go to goldenjackass.com, www.goldenjackass.com, you find a, a public page. It in, includes a lot of radio shows like this. I try to repeat with hosts only if they allow the interview to be posted, even, even with some delay. Uh, there's public articles that are on the way, main web webpage. Um, once people are more familiar, or if they're already quite familiar and, and they are somewhat impressed by the quality, I hope they sign up for the newsletter. <clears throat> the newsletter has two parts each month. I should say there are two posted reports each month. One is called the Global Money War Report, and that focuses on high-level things like defense of the dollar, uh, use of war to defend the dollar, blockage of Gazprom uh, for provision to Western Europe in energy supply. Uh, the Eurasian trade zone, and, and other issues like that, I put in the second report that, that is focused.